Hi, so this is a copy of the webinar that I've just spoken at for the European Society for Emergency Medicine about biomarkers of acute coronary syndromes. So we're going to go through this and I'm going to talk about how we use cardiac troponin for diagnosing acute coronary syndromes. There are loads of biomarkers that have been explored for acute coronary syndromes, heart type fatty acid binding protein, copeptin, CMIC, and going back even further, there are loads more like in ischemia modified albumin, ICAM, VCAM, P-selectin, E-selectin, so many you can't imagine. Only cardiac troponin has really made it into mainstream practice so far, and that's what I'm gonna talk about. And the first thing when we talk about troponin, to bear in mind, is that it's not a marker of myocardial infarction. It's a marker of myocardial injury. Only a clinician can diagnose a myocardial infarction. The troponin is only going to tell us whether there's myocardial injury. We've then got to apply some clinical judgment around that to decide if the cause of that myocardial injury is a myocardial infarction or something else. So just to emphasize that point, let's go through the universal definition of myocardial infarction. This is the fourth universal definition. And we can see from that that Troponin is central to the diagnosis of MI. It's an essential criterion. You have to have a troponin rise or fall with one level above the 99th percentile per reference range, at least one, one, one level, to diagnose an MI. Now, if that's all you have, a troponin rise or fall with one level at least above the 99th percentile, you don't have a myocardial infarction. You have a myocardial injury. Now, if you've detected a myocardial injury, the next thing you want to know is, is it acute or chronic? If it's acute, that means it's changing over time. So there's gonna be a rise or a fall when we do serial sampling. So that's the delta that I'm talking about on this slide. So in general, a significant delta is at least half the 99th percentile of the assay. So let's say your 99th percentile or upper reference limit is 14 nanograms per liter, then around about seven nanograms per liter would be a significant change. That's a rule of thumb. Better to know the evidence for your assay, but that's a rule of thumb for what's a significant change. And by the way, it's better to have an absolute change, so maximum minus minimum value, rather than a percentage change that seems to be more sensitive for detecting an acute injury. Now, there are loads of different causes of myocardial injury that aren't a myocardial infarction, and we can differentiate them into acute and chronic injury. So on the left, we've got a selection of different causes of acute myocardial injury. And it is just a selection because there's loads of causes. Tachyarrhythmia, myocarditis, acute heart failure, cardiac trauma, they're all cardiac causes of acute myocardial injury. And then there are some non-cardiac causes as well. So pulmonary embolism or stroke, subarachnoid hemorrhage can also cause acute myocardial injury. We don't quite know why, but it does happen. And then there are chronic causes of myocardial injury. So these are levels that are static, they don't change over time. And they could be heart failure, cardiomyopathy, cardi uh, sorry, coronary artery disease with diffuse ischemia or valvular heart disease. They're all cardiac causes. And again, you've got your non-cardiac causes as well. CKD we're all familiar with. Did you know that diabetes can cause a high troponin uh, on a chronic basis? As you get older and you have more comorbidities, you can have a chronic myocardial injury. We know if you've got a higher cardiac risk factor burden, for example, you have a higher troponin level at baseline. They're all causes of chronic myocardial injury. We've got to differentiate those from a myocardial infarction. Now, to diagnose a myocardial infarction, we need one more thing, because none of those causes, if they're just injury, have evidence of myocardial ischemia. So the universal definition tells us that we not only need that troponin rise or fall and an acute myocardial injury, but we also need one of these four things here. So we need either symptoms of myocardial ischemia, they don't need to be typical, but they need to be there, compatible with ischemia, or we need ECG changes like ST depression, T wave inversion, new Q waves, or we need new imaging evidence of loss of viable myocardium, like an echo wall motion abnormality, for example, or we need to find a thrombus on angiogram or on postmortem. If we have one of those four things and the troponin rise or fall, then we've got an acute myocardial infarction. Next question, what kind of myocardial infarction do we have? Because only a type one, myocardial infarction will benefit from the usual treatments with antiplatelets, statins, coronary vascularization straight away. Type 1 is where this is related to coronary artery disease and there's a plaque rupture or erosion or dissection that's led to the problem. We know how to treat those. Type 2 is very common in emergency medicine 
and we have to be familiar with this concept. This is related to an imbalance of supply and demand of oxygen to the myocardium. So it could be that the patient is septic or they've had a massive GI bleed or they've got a tachyarrhythmia with evidence of ischemia. They all can cause a type two myocardial infarction. And the way we approach that at the moment is to address the underlying cause rather than treating the MI per se. Uh, so we'll come back to that later, but we treat the underlying cause first. Type three MI is sudden cardiac death. Type four and five are related to PCI or cabbage. But it's important that we know about those and we use our clinical judgment to decide which type of myocardial infarction it is based on the context. Let's delve in a little bit deeper about how we use cardiac troponin assays in practice. So before we had high sensitivity troponin assays about a decade ago, this is what a troponin assay looked like. So every assay has a cutoff, the upper reference limit, the 99th percentile. So we get that by measuring troponin in, a, in hundreds of healthy individuals and we set the cutoff at the 99th percentile. The limit of detection or LOD is the lowest concentration the assay can detect. And the CV is the coefficient of variation. It's how much the result might vary, roughly, if we measure the same sample over and over again. And it should be less than 10% at the cutoff. Now, the lower the troponin concentration you're trying to measure, the harder it is to get a precise result and the higher that CV will be. With the old troponin assays, we couldn't measure troponin in healthy individuals. So the cutoff was the same as the limit of detection. And we couldn't get a precise result until we got to a concentration way above that. So it was a big challenge. And that meant that we couldn't detect troponin for a long time after symptom onset because we're detecting big levels of troponin only. With high sensitivity assays, the 99th percentiles here are roughly the same. And now though, we can detect much smaller levels of troponin. So the limit of detection is way down here and we can detect it much more precisely. So the 10% CV is well below the 99th percentile. So we can detect small amounts of troponin very precisely. How is that important for us in emergency medicine? Well, if you're having a myocardial infarction, troponin is leaking out into your bloodstream over time, and that concentration will rise over time to a point when it starts to fall again. Now, if we set the cutoff low, it won't take us as long to pass that threshold as it would if we have a higher threshold. So with a high sensitivity assay, being able to detect small concentrations, patients with an MI will pass those small thresholds much faster. And that means if they're below that threshold after a certain time, we can say they're not having a myocardial infarction quite confidently. So it helps us with early rule out. And we use that with the, our current approach, the zero one hour algorithm of troponin, for example, which is well accepted now, used widely in practice, advocated by the European Society of Cardiology and has a great evidence base for it. And now with this, we can do a single test on arrival in the emergency department and if your troponin level is below the limit of detection of the assay or around the limit of detection of the assay, we can say that those patients don't have NMI and they're ruled out straight away. For other patients who don't quite meet those criteria, but the troponin level is still relatively low, it's below the cutoff, we can repeat the sample an hour later. And if there's no significant change, we also rule out. So between those two tests, we've got most people home and reassured, ruled out an MI. If the troponin level is really high or there's a significant change at one hour, we can rule in, leaving just a relatively small group in the observed group in the middle. And this can really help us. It's got a great evidence base. There's a short interval between tests. That's great for us in crowded emergency departments. However, there are challenges. The lab turnaround time is often too long for us to see the results before we decide whether we need that second test. So that can be challenging in a crowded emergency department, which means that the second test could be done anywhere between one and three hours after the first one. And there's flexibility on that. NICE recommends the second test is one to three hours later. And that's really a logistical issue rather than the evidence base for the zero one hour algorithm. What about decision aids? Where do they fit in? Well, we've got the heart score. It's very widely used. And this is a very simple score like the APGAR score. We use a history, ECG, age, risk factors, and troponin. And we decide if a patient has is likely to have an MI or a major adverse cardiac event in the next 30 days. Very widely used, uh, fairly sensitive uh, and been studied extensively. Um, and it's, you know, it's very intuitive. The one thing I'd say is you have to modify it if you're going to use it in practice. Never use the troponin in its original format because you could send someone home with a troponin that's way above three times the 99th percentile. And that's not really good practice. You want to investigate why that troponin is so high. So we, do, we routinely do serial sampling for those patients and have a look for, at them a bit more closely. 
So you'd modify it if you're going to use it in practice. Let me tell you a little bit about TMAX, the troponin-only Manchester ACS decision aid, which is like heart because it aims to rule out patients early in the emergency department with one test on arrival in the emergency department. It was derived by machine learning. It combines elements of the patient's history, their ECG and their troponin. It calculates the probability that they have a myocardial infarction. And then it stratifies the patients into four groups, rule out, rule in, and then two in the middle. Low risk can go to ambulatory care for a second troponin. Moderate risk might need a little bit more workup. So you might send them to an acute medical unit, for example. We compared that to the heart score directly in an observational study, and you can see it's got better negative predictive value, so fewer patients in the rule-out group have an MI than with the heart score. It's got better positive predictive value, so in the rule-in group, more patients who were identified as high risk by Tmax had an MI compared to heart. And also it's more efficient, so it allowed more people to go home, 47% with Tmax, than it does with, than with the heart score, which was 30%. It's got some other advantages too. So it handles troponin as a continuous variable, meaning the higher the troponin, the higher the probability of MI that you get as an output. And that reflects reality. This is, these, these are data from one of our studies where we show the, the prevalence of MI based on your first troponin concentration. And you can see there's a continuum of risk here. And we lose that richness of information if we set the cutoff at any one point here. So treating troponin as a continuous variable has a lot of attraction. And I think we're likely to see more and more models that do that in the future, not just TMAX, there are others coming that will do the same thing. Now, that probability has some useful functions for us, that probability of an MI that we can calculate with TMAX. One, it's more accurate than the clinician judgments about whether a patient has an MI. So here's the area under the rock curve with TMAX and clinician Gestalt in one of our studies, a multi-center study. And you can see TMAX had far greater diagnostic accuracy than clinicians. It also gave a better calibrated estimate of probability. So these are calibration plots. And what we should see if, if, if our, our probability estimate is accurate, so we think it's 4%, it really is 4%, or we think it's 71%, it really is 71%, then we should see a line that follows the diagonal. And with clinicians, we can see we systematically overestimate risk. Whereas with Tmax, we had a very well calibrated estimate of probability. And when we get a well calibrated estimate of probability, we can use that to inform patients about the risk. And that will allow us to personalize shared decision-making, inform patients of the risk, engage them in the decision-making process. In the US, Eric Hess evaluated shared decision-making. He showed that when patients were given the opportunity to have shared decision-making, they knew more about their care, played a more active role in their decisions about their care, and more often chose to go home without any suggestion that they had worse outcomes. Let's talk lastly about point of care troponin testing. Now, previously, point of care troponin assays were nowhere near as good as lab assays. Here's an example. So at the bottom of this slide, we've got a lab assay that's high sensitivity, and I've just plotted the limit of detection. It's an example of the difference between the assays. Here for rabbit's assay, it's two nanograms per litre. The point of care assays that were available until very recently had limits of detection that were way above that. They couldn't detect the small concentrations of troponin that we need to rule out an MI early. So that meant that we couldn't really use them in the emergency department for rule out. But now we've got commercially available high sensitivity troponin assays, and there are three of them on the market at present that I'm aware of. The PathFast, the Quidel Triage True, and the Seams Atelica VTLI. They offer lab standard performance at the point of care. Now, really importantly, we need the evidence for these assays before we use them. And it's starting to emerge. So, for example, we have this published evaluation from Fred Apple in Minnesota, where they studied over a thousand patients with chest pain. And they found that this assay could rule out an MI for 21% of patients with a single test using a cutoff of four nanograms per litre. And they achieved really high negative predictive value and sensitivity. Very promising data. Now we need validation before we use that in practice and there are plenty of studies ongoing, but it's very promising data to suggest we will be able to do it. Now before we use it, we not only need more evidence for the, for the accuracy of these assays, but also we need evidence of cost effectiveness. It's going to cost more in the ED to do point of care testing, it always does. So we need to show the extra value from doing the point of care test and that will be reduction in length of stay, more rapid turnaround for our patients. And to get that, we don't just need the test, but we need to have a look at our care pathways. So if we're gonna do a test with a rapid result, we need to show that we can act on that result rapidly. The patient won't just be left waiting for the result. We might have well had a lab test. We've gotta get 
be disruptive with our care pathway so that patients can benefit from having a result much earlier. And that's going to require a piece of work. So in summary, I've talked about acute myocardial injury and chronic myocardial injury. Troponin is a marker of injury. It's acute injury if it changes over time, rises or falls when we, when we retest. It's chronic if it doesn't change over time. And we've gone through the causes of that. We've talked about how myocardial infarction is different because we've got signs of ischemia. One of those four signs in the universal definition has to be added to the myocardial injury that we detect. And lastly, we've talked about evidence-based rule-out pathways, the heart score, TMAX score, advantages of machine learning models, the potential for personalized shared decision-making. And we've talked about points of care troponin testing, which is hopefully coming very soon, although probably not quite ready for prime time just yet, pending the data. Thank you.